Hello everyone, it's great to be here. Before I start talking about CSS variables, I feel I should introduce myself. So, hola, hoy uh, soy Alia. I probably horribly mispronounced this, and this is where my Portuguese ends. So the rest of the talk will be in English. Uh, here's a fun fact about me. I'm originally from Greece, and specifically from the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian. <laughs> Probably one of the very few you'll meet in your lifetime. <laughs> I like making stuff. You might have used some of my work. Uh, you can find all of my work on GitHub. Uh, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group. And as my day job, I do HCI research at MIT. HCI is just the academic term for usability. And I've written a book, uh, shameless plug here. You should totally buy it. It has five stars on Amazon. And now on to our main topic, CSS variables. So the first variable ever in CSS, we've actually had it for many, many years, and it's current color. How many of you have used current color or know about it? A few. I expected more. So current color always refers to the value of the, co of the color property. It's supported in every browser, even IE9. So for example, here, if I change this color to blue, don't use this horrible blue, um, uh, my gradient changed as well because it's using current color. So let's change it to a nicer color. So CSS variables extends, extends this concept to pretty much anything we want. So I could have a color variable here and I define variables with dash dash. They're basically properties that start with dash dash. Think of them as properties with a, an empty prefix. That was the idea, that's where the dash dash comes from. And yes, we know it's terrible, but we wanted something that will not clash with preprocessor variables because they serve different purposes. So they can, they can be used together with preprocessor variables. You can use SAS variables for static things. And because CSS variables are more dynamic, you can use them for more dynamic things, as we'll see in this talk. And you refer to them with the var function you can also provide a fallback, let's say gray, and if the variable is not defined, it uses the fallback. And let me use color here as well. So now, if I change, if I change the value of the color property to something else, say, I don't know, green, as you can see, it changes as well. You might not be particularly excited at this point because we can do the same thing with current color with much better browser support. But with CSS variables, we can customize pretty much anything we want. So here, I have a gradient, uh, and depending on where this color stop is, the size of these, corner cha of these corners changes. So I could have a variable about this, say corners, 10 pixels. Uh, and then I can go here and use the calc function and say corners, 100% minus corners. And let me break this so you can see what I'm doing here. And now I can change the size of the corners just through the, corner, uh, the, the corners property. And you might not see the value very much here because it's just one rule, but I can use dash dash corners everywhere, including inline styles. I can go to the HTML and write this, and it still works. I can do it from JavaScript. It's basically, it functions exactly as any other CSS property. So the first takeaway is that CSS variables work exactly like normal CSS properties which also means that they're inherited. So as you can see here, I've defined that the outline, uh, the outline, the value of the outline property on every div is taken from the dash dash outline custom property, and I've defined it here. Block one is just this div, and as you can see, this outline is also inherited by the inner div, because this, this rule also applies to the inner div, and dash dash outline is inherited to that as well. And of course, I can apply it anywhere. If I want to target specifically the inner div, I can just do this. 
the first, the, so the second takeaway is that CSS variables are, in, are not just like every other property, they're inherited properties. So you might be wondering, okay, this doesn't sound very convenient for many cases. How can I cancel this inheritance? You can cancel this inheritance by adding a universal rule that basically says dash dash outline is equal to its initial value. Whoops. And as you can see, now it's not inherited anymore. Because uh, inheritance always has lower priority than, in, than any rule that actually applies directly to the element. And even the universal selector that has zero specificity still applies directly to the element. So this is a very useful trick. And we'll see later on in this talk how exactly it's useful in many cases to do cool things. So third takeaway, yes, CSS variables are inherited properties, but you can change that if you want. So let's say we had a background image like this one and we wanted to be able to change it. So we defined a variable, say, and we gave it the value of sad and we wanted to build this URL from that variable. So we thought of doing something like this and we were expecting it to work, right? But it doesn't. And not only this doesn't work, but even if, even if we try to put the entire URL in the variable, like this, it still doesn't work. The only thing that works here is if we put the entire thing in the variable. Or not. I swear this worked before. Maybe it's some weirdness. No. Uh, you know what do they say about live demos? Anyway, this is supposed to work. Let's all pretend this worked and move on. So, the fourth takeaway, variables don't mix well with URL. The problem is uh, because the URL, you, the URL function, it's some arcane restriction because the URL function accepts URLs without, with and without quotes. So it's doing some really weird parsing there. Uh, eventually we will fix it probably by adding another function to do URLs that's, that where variables will work in that. But right now, sadly, you cannot build URLs with variables, which is very unfortunate. There are some more WTFs about variables as with any CSS feature. So, full colon, uh, a variable with an empty value is invalid. I'm not surprised. This is to be expected, right? Any CSS property with an empty value is invalid. However, if the value is one space, it's valid. And the value of the variable is one space. Also, they're case sensitive. Uppercase dash dash, dash foo uppercase is different than dash dash foo lowercase. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Eh. So I mentioned before that you can provide fallbacks as the second parameter of the var function. So how exactly do these fallbacks work? So let's look at this code for a bit. I have a, a background red declaration, same as it's been since CSS1. And I have a background declaration that uses a variable with a fallback of orange. So if CSS variables are not supported at all, that's easy. Uh, the var uh, declaration will be invalid, so we'll fall back to red. Pretty much expected. If, there's, if CSS variables are supported, but there's no accent color set, then we'll get orange. Still kind of expected since we specified it as the fallback. But this is the, this, this is the difference between the two fallback mechanisms, uh, having a different declaration or having a fallback in the, in the var function. Of course, if we specify an accent color, we'll get that accent color, otherwise variables would be kind of useless. And an interesting case is, if we specify the variable, but with something that is not a valid color, that is not a valid value for the background, we will not get any of the two fallbacks we've specified. 
we will not get red, we will not get orange. Because this falls into something that is called invalid at computed, uh, at computed value time, which is basically the technical term that means background doesn't know about any fallbacks at this point. It has already substituted accent color in the property. It, it has thrown away red, it has thrown away orange, it doesn't know what to do, it falls back to its initial value, which is none. And another good thing about fallbacks is that you can daisy chain them. So you can put a variable as the fallback of another variable and another variable and a color there. You can combine them in any way you see fit. Uh, a good thing about variables is that you can use them with the at supports rule to apply different CSS in bra on browsers that support CSS variables and different CSS in browsers that don't support variables. If a browser doesn't support variables, this entire rule will not match and you'll get a background of red in this case. And as you can see, you can write any CSS you want here, not necessarily CSS that involves variables. And if you want to apply CSS uh, on different CSS on browsers that don't support variables, you can use the not operator. And because this browser I'm using does support variables, this is not applied, so it's falling back to red. So I know some of you might be thinking, many of you probably, how many of you are thinking something along these lines right now? Would somebody please think of browser support? Okay, these things are cool, but surely no browser really supports them, right? Actually, that's not quite true. Every browser today supports CSS variables, except, except Edge. But, fear not, because Edge is implementing it. They have announced that they're working on it, and it will probably be on the next version of Edge, Edge 15. So you can always, Edge, Edge has such a small market share right now, that it's a reasonable way to go uh, to just write your CSS with variables and provide a rudimentary fallback for, for Edge. Uh, one thing to keep in mind that confuses many people that come from the SAS world is that variable values are token lists, which sounds very technical, so I'm going to explain exactly what it means right now. So, let's say you have um, a div like this, which you want to always be square and you want it to depend on the font size, and you want when you, regardless of what the font size is, you want it to remain a square, you want it to always be a square. So you're thinking, I don't want to type the, 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 the side like two times and if I want to change it from 10 M's to 9 M's, have to change it twice. That's not dry code. So you might think to abstract this away in a variable. And if you come from the SAS world, you might think, I don't want to repeat M's either. Maybe I can just do something like this. And then this. And it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that size already has a type of 10. It's a number. It's not a length. And you cannot change it into a length by just concatenating M's with that. It doesn't work that way. In SAS, it works that way because it doesn't have a concept of types. It just spits out CSS and it goes to your browser and the browser doesn't know you even used SAS, which has both advantages and disadvantages, mostly disadvantages. But in this case, it does do what you expect where CSS variables don't. What you can do instead is either define something's wrong with this microphone. You can either define your size to be 10 M's, or you can do something horrible <laughs> like this, and that will work. And you might be thinking, why would I do this horrible thing instead of just using 10 M's? Well, you might want the 10, you might want to use the 10 in something else as well. Um, if you define 10 M's, how do you convert it to a 10? And so that you don't have to repeat this, you can also abstract it away into another variable side, for example. And then you can do something like this. And as you can see, it works. And I can even change the multiplier here. So, I kind of alluded to this. Um, 
You can convert from a number to a unit by just multiplying by one in the unit. You cannot convert from a unit to a number. So if I had if I had 10 m's here, I cannot convert that size to 10 anywhere. Say I want to use uh, I want to use it in the content property or something. I, would, I want to display a 10 or something. I cannot do this. There is no way today in CSS to to take a number as a CSS variable and con uh, and to take a unit a length and convert it to a number. Which takes us to the fifth takeaway. You should try to use variables for pure data instead of CSS values. Like put numbers, strings, not things like 10 pixels in your variables. Try to put like the least amount of, of the smallest piece of information you can. So at this point some of you might be thinking uh, about animation and you might be thinking of all the cool things we can do if we, con if we combine uh, variables and animation. I'm afraid you might be a little disappointed. So here we have an existing animation. It works. Um, it's going from yellow to blue. Can everyone see this, the, the animation, or should I change the colors into something less subtle? Okay, so what happens if, in, if we do, if we set background color to a variable, say PG, and we try to animate the variable instead? So as you can see, as you can see nothing much really happens. And it's not because it doesn't. It, it's not because it doesn't work. I can set. I can set the variable here to orange, and it just. It works just fine. But it's. It's dropped from the animation. Part of this is expected, and part of this is a bug. So, what is expected uh, is that variables do not smoothly animate because the browser technically doesn't know exactly how to animate them. This is the actual quote from the spec. Uh, CSS variables can even be transitioned or animated, but since the, user, the browser has no way to interpret their contents, they always use the flips at 50% behavior that is used for any other pair of values that can't be intelligently interpolated. So this is spec keys for the browser doesn't know how to animate them, so it should just flip from one to the other abruptly. So what we should be seeing here is yellow that flips to blue without any smooth transition. However, Chrome is being buggy and it's not even doing this. <laughs> so yeah, CSS variables and animations, not a very good combination. In the near future, we will be able to register our custom properties with a certain type so that the browser does know how to, implement, how to animate them. Sadly, it will be done through JavaScript, uh, which I think is a mistake because not every CSS author knows JavaScript. But this is what is planned right now. And maybe in the bit more far future, there will be a way to do this in CSS as well. So. You might be wondering, okay, I cannot animate uh, custom properties, but can I use these variables in my animations? So let's switch back to what we had in the beginning. And let's say we had a variable of color 1 that had our yellow, and color 2 that had the blue color. So I should be able to do this. As you can see, this works just fine. What doesn't work right now in Chrome is this. If instead of background color, I try to animate background with a variable, it just gives up, throws its hand in the air, and doesn't do any interpolation. 
folks, on the other hand, works just fine here. So this is, this is a bug. This is not expected behavior. This should work. But even though CSS variables are supported everywhere, there are still a few bugs here and there, which you can figure out by testing. There are not that many. Don't let, don't let this scare you. I've just isolated them for this presentation. Also, another thing that gives us hope is transitions. So here I have a simple transition. When I'm clicking on uh, this slide, the background becomes blue. So when you see it changing to blue, it's because I'm clicking on it. And I have a transition here. So what if I was doing this? Let's say BG again. And let's give BG a value. And let's change its value when I'm clicking. So as you can see, even though I'm not actually transition, I'm not actually changing the background, changing the variable, the transition still works. And the reason the transition works is because the value, the variable is substituted in the background property, and then that substitution triggers the transition. It's not that the variable itself is, is transitionable. If I limit my transition to the BG, uh, the dash dash BG property, there is no transition anymore. It just abruptly goes to, to blue. It doesn't know how to transition it anymore. It's the background that is doing all this. But still, there is, there is a way. There is some hope. So let's see some basic, uh, some more ba some basic use cases about how CSS variables can be useful today. A very common pattern today is having a button like this and having different variations. So we define our base button styling. It has, a, it has a, a, a black border, a transparent background. Then when I hover on it, it gets a, the border color becomes a background and the text color becomes black. These kinds of buttons are super common these days with all this flat design stuff. And people often create variations of them with like a class, like pink, for example, which defines different colors. However, with CSS variables, we could create something that resembles a SAS mix in, in a way. So we could have a dash dash color property and set the border based on that color property. Then on hover, use the same variable here. And then I don't even, I don't need this at all. I don't need this rule. I can just specify the dash dash color is pink. Uh, oh, and I also need to do, to set the text color. Yep. So as you can see, I'm getting exactly the same effect with way less code. But it's not just about minimizing code. Whereas before, I had to create variations of this component manually by adding classes and specifying them explicitly. Now, I can create any variation I want. I can go to, I can completely remove this, this rule. Instead, I can go to the HTML, I can remove this, and set the style attribute to whatever color, blue. And it still works. It still follows exactly the design I wanted. I can change it. Still, I, well, before I had a, a, a couple of variations that I had to define explicitly. Now I essentially have infinite variations. It also enables us to style components in such a way that we don't have to worry. The sound is a bit weird. Okay. It also allows us to define components in such a way that we don't, to style components in a way that we don't have to worry about their internal structure. Let's say I created this button. Uh, it's a very simple component, but you get the idea. And someone else wanted to use my button. So they used my CSS 
And before, if they wanted a pink button, they had to know how am I styling this button and know what CSS rules they have to write to style my button pink. Whereas now, they don't have to know anything. They don't have to know how making this button work. All they have to know is that they have to use this dash dash color property to, to skin it. For example, if I want to change the hover effect and I want to, I want to make it into a box shadow transition. Let's see, will this work? Let's suppose I wanted to do it with box shadow so I could have this kind of effect. I could make this change to my component and whoever is using it and, sk and, and skinning it doesn't have to even know about this change. They don't have to change their code, they don't have to do anything. It just, it, it just works. So the seventh takeaway is that CSS variables enable theming completely independent of CSS structure and with much less code. Oh, also something I forgot to show a bit. So let's suppose I wanted to set a default value for someone who is using this component without, um, without specifying a color property. Let's say I wanted this default value to be red. I could do this everywhere, but it's getting kind of repetitive and the whole point of variables is to reduce this kind of repetition. So instead of doing that, I could define, say, a call property that has this default baked in. And now instead of using caller with its, with its default value, I just use call. And whoever is using my component doesn't have to know anything about this. As long as I don't tell them that I'm using dash dash call, if they don't read my code, they don't have to know about it. And if they read my code, well, they can do whatever they want anyway. So yeah, default default values are possible by defining different variables. And yes, I just invented the term default default values. I think it's kind of cool. Let's popularize it. Also a classic use case for variables is responsive design. You can define, instead of having to define media queries that completely change the layout, you can just define different values of variables in media queries and you don't have to change the actual styling. It just works and it just gets the current value of the variable, which is something you cannot do with SAS variables. This kind of thing will not work with SAS variables because they, they, they don't work like this. They don't know what your structure is. They don't know uh, what, what, oh, ouch. Sorry about that. I should move less. Uh, it, it doesn't know what your structure is, um, it doesn't know what's inside what, and SAS of course doesn't know what's, your, what's the size of your viewport or anything. So let's see how this works. If I get out of full screen and reduce the size of this window, <coughs> yeah, you can see that at this point Let's increase this breakpoint a bit. So you can see how at some point it just switches to the smaller gutter size. So ninth takeaway, CSS variables make responsive design much easier. So now that, we've dis now that we've discussed what CSS variables were actually designed for, let's discuss some cool use cases that are a bit more, uh, more like hacks that you can do with CSS variables, but I think are much more interesting. So CSS variables allow you to do auto prefixing. Uh, let's say you want to use clip path and until recently, you needed to specify two versions, WebKit cl clip path and clip path, uh, because WebKit and Blink still needed a prefix there. So instead of having to, do, uh, to use both variations or to use some script like uh, some build script like auto prefixer or some runtime script like prefix free, you can, you can just use CSS variables for this. So let's 
So let's see how this works. I have the universal selector, I have defined the dash dash clip path property, uh, and I've given it a value of initial, which if you remember earlier in this talk, cancels inheritance because we don't want clip path to actually inherit. And if clip path is actually, if dash dash clip path is actually defined, then both clip path and WebKit clip path will be set to it. If they're not defined, then both clip path and WebKit clip path will be set to their initial value because that's what happens when you use an invalid variable. So let's try it out. Let me try to define a diamond shape. And let's hope I can actually code this right now. So, 50%, 100, and 0, 50% vertically. So there it is. And as you can see now it applies to every div, because I actually applied it to every div. But let's say I just wanted to apply it to the first outer div, block 1. So as you can see, it's only applied there, and it's most importantly, it's not applied to its child. This is the structure I have. It's kind of a dummy structure just to show you uh, what's happening. Don't use that many divs. Use something more meaningful. But for the purposes of this example, uh, this is my structure. And what I'm trying to show you is that even though I've applied it to this outer div, it's not actually inherited. If I wanted to apply it to the inner div, of course, I could do this. Or if I, could, if I wanted to apply it to all divs, I could do this, all inner divs, or this, and so on. It works exactly the same as the clip path property, except I only have to type it once. Not exactly. If you remember earlier in this talk, uh, we have issues when we try to animate CSS variables, so it will not actually be animatable, which is a very cool case for clip path. You really want to be able to animate it. But in cases when you don't care about animation, this could be a decent solution. But you might be thinking, okay, I don't really care about auto-prefixing. I'm using auto-prefixer already. Uh, there aren't that many properties that need a prefix anymore anyway. Uh, so, yeah, let's move on. So based, it's the same principle that, uh, that allows you to do a lot of cool things, not just, not not just auto-prefixing. Let's assume I wanted to have purple shadows in many places in my design. Uh, so I defined uh, this purple shadow property, and then I set box shadow to just flat out include purple shadow and have a Rebecca purple color. So then I can use purple shadow anywhere without having to define a color for it. It just uses this one. And if, box shadow, if purple shadow is not defined, then the entire value of box shadow will be invalid, so it won't be applied anyway. And yes, I can use, if I, if I want to use a, a different colored box shadow, I can always override it and do something like this. Of course, that still works. The re regular CSS rules apply because the universal selector has the lower specificity of anything. So, if I have explicitly specified a box shadow property somewhere, that will have the highest priority. But otherwise, if I define purple shadow, um, box shadow will have a value and it will fill in the remaining values and I'll have a, pur a purple shadow. And as you can see, I can change them in any way I want. I can make it an even more horrible shadow. And of course, if I remove it, there's no shadow. It works exactly as you would expect a purple shadow property to work, except you've defined it. You don't have to wait for the spec to define a purple shadow property. And similarly, this is a bit more code, but it's very repetitive. So if you understand like the first few uh, lines, it's basically setting, it's basically defining CSS variables for every part uh, of the box shadow property, and then it's setting box, box shadow to a bunch of these variables so we can control them independently. And that enables you to create your own shorthands, which I think is pretty cool. Notice the trick here is that all of them have default values except blur. So 
Think of native CSS short shorthands. How do they work? You always have to specify at least something for them to work. Like in background, for example, um, maybe background is not a very good example. Um, sorry, long hands, not, not custom short hands. Uh, so for long hands, you have to specify something for them to work. Like uh, if you specify background position without a background image, it doesn't really do anything. If you specify background size without background image, it doesn't really do anything. For background, uh, for, for, for background, for example, um, you have to specify at least a background color or a background image, otherwise none of the other properties do anything. So it's the same with our custom longhands here. Uh, I can independently control any of them as long as I specify at least a blur. So, for example, let's move the shadow a bit. And yes, I know this is horrible design, but I'm just trying to show how this works. And of course, if I remove the blur, none of them show up. So essentially, I took a property that doesn't have long hands, and I converted it into something that does. The sad part about it is that any code that uses it needs to be aware of these variables. It does, it, we can't just create our custom shorthands and expect people that don't know they, they exist to be able to use them. And note, by the way, that here I've specified a fallback that is actually a space. Because that's what you want for the default value of inset. Nothing. Because inset either exists or doesn't exist. And another, another cool use case is that you can define a prepend property uh, that allows you to prepend text. So instead of having to define a, 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 a pseudo-element rule for it, so let's say so I can just use a, a, a property on any rule to prepend text to it without having to specify a second rule like a, a, a before rule. I can just put a, pre, put a prepend along with every other styling it has. And I can do that on anything. I can do that on every divs. Uh, on all divs. I can, either, I can even do this inline. Oops. Quotes. Death by quotes. There it is. Or I can put it here in line. Whoa. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Damn. And being able to set styles in line is super useful when, doing th when combining CSS with JavaScript. Because it's quite a mess to get JavaScript to change the style sheet, but it's very easy to get it to set an inline style. So, takeaway number 10. CSS variables let you define your own properties. And now, uh, let's move on to what happens if we combine CSS variables with JavaScript. And the answer is many cool things. How many of you uh, write JavaScript? Okay, I'm sorry for the rest of you. The JavaScript is very short. It's only like a few lines, and I will explain it. So, the th there are three basic methods that help you get and set ver CSS variables from uh, JavaScript. You cannot use the common syntax. Uh, say, if you want to get or set the font, uh, the font size, you write element.style.fontsize. Uh, you cannot do this with variables. Instead, with variables, you have to use the more generic functions that we have, uh, like get property value. And if you, if you do element.style.getPropertyValue, then that will only give you the value of the variable if it's on the inline style. If you want to get whatever, what value the variable has, regardless of where it's set on and where it could be inherited from or anything, you can use compu get computed style first instead of element.style. And if you want to set a variable on the inline style of the element, but usually that's what we want, uh, you use set property. Now, you might have noticed something. Why is it set property, but get property value? Why is it not get property? I don't know. <laughs> it's yet another API design mistake of the CSSOM, as 
there are many. We just have to live with it and make a ton of mistakes. So, one of the really cool things, basically CSS variables let you write like a little bit of JavaScript and do things that you needed quite a lot of code to do before. And you needed to move a lot of CSS to JavaScript to do them, whereas now you can keep your CSS where it belongs and just set the data with JavaScript. For example, let's say you want to vary your style based on the mouse movement. Let's say you want a gradient whose center changes depending on how you move your mouse. You can use JavaScript to just set those variables and then you can use them in your gradient. You don't have to actually move your entire gradient in JavaScript and have your developer talk to your designer and, and fight about how the gradient will be styled. No, you just get the developer to write the JavaScript and then the designer can tweak their gradient as much as they want without having to fight with anyone. So we, add an, uh, we can add an event uh, to the whole document because we want to capture the mouse movement re regardless of where it is. This is what add event listener does. Then we have this function. Uh, if you're not familiar with this syntax, it's just arrow functions. It's very similar to using the function keyword, just shorter, and it has a few differences. I'm not going to get into them right now. Uh, and then we use set property, as we mentioned before, and we set a mouse X and a mouse Y property. And client X and client Y are the properties of the event object that let you get the mouse position. And we also, get, we, we also concatenate it with PX, so we don't have to do all this weird calc stuff. Um, it's a bit risky because it means we cannot get the numbers anywhere in our CSS. But in this case, that's what we wanted. We didn't need the numbers anywhere, so it's kind of OK. And here you can see the result. I'm moving the mouse here, the gradient moves. And I have specified defaults as well so that if this fails, if the JavaScript doesn't load, um, if anything goes wrong, it's just a gradient in the center. And I can, I can do things like, let's say, will this work? No? Like that. Let's make it into a whole circle, actually, uh, without any gradient. Just because it's cool. So as you can see now, we can do a lot of cool effects. I can also say circle. And now it's always a circle, and it just changes sizes, depending on where I move it. So you get the idea. Uh, another, th uh, another thing is that you can use a little bit of JavaScript to set a, a, a dash dash value property on any, on any input element that you have. And then you can apply styling, depending on what the value is. How many of you have wished you could get the value of a form control in your CSS. Okay, fewer than I expected. I don't know, I, w I wished it so many times. Okay, that's a lot of lights. <laughs> Am I supposed to infer something from that? Is that a hint? <laughs> um, so here I'm, s um, I'm going over all input elements uh, and I'm setting a dash dash value property on them with their current value. And I'm also adding an event to the document. I'm using event delegation here, uh, listening to, uh, on, on the event. Instead of listening on any individual element, I'm listening on the entire document. So I don't have, uh, so I don't have to attach a bunch of listeners. Uh, I'm getting what the input element I have here and setting dash dash value on it again so that it's dynamic. Otherwise, if I just, if I just did this, I would get the right value, but it wouldn't change as I'm changing the input. But it's still, it's basically four lines of JavaScript. This is just a, a shortcut. And let's see what I can do with that. Let's say I have a slider here and move this to the center and move this to 
the center as well. And do this to avoid repeating 50%. So now I can move the slider, but nothing changes because it's statically set to 50%. But instead, I can use the dash dash value that I already have coded. So I have to use calc because that's just a number and it doesn't mean anything. So I have to convert it to a percentage by multiplying it with 1%. And as you can see, now I move the slider and it actually works. And yes, that's kind of ugly, but it's a basic example that works. Another thing that variables uh, make much better is this typing effect. So I posted about this typing effect a few years ago, way before variables. And it was, let me show you uh, how this works a little bit before we get into why variables are relevant and how they improve it. So here I have a paragraph with a class of typing. Uh, it has a width set in number of characters with the CH unit. It has a border that is animated from transparent to, to, the, to the color of the text, which is why I have a carrot that is flashing. That's just a border that is animated. Here is the animation that animates it. Uh, and I have overflow hidden because I want to be able to reduce the width and hide characters. So that, because if I reduce the width like this manually, you can see how it reveals one character at a time. That's why I used CH. So let's make an animation about this. I already have a, ty a, a typing, uh, an animation rule called, called typing that just goes from width zero to whatever the current width of the, uh, to whatever the current width is. And so I can uh, do Typing here, let's say 10 seconds, or is that two? No, it's five seconds. And if I remove it and reapply it, you see it doesn't work yet. I have to also specify a steps timing function with the same number of steps as the characters I have. And you can see this works. It's, it makes it look like it's actually typing text, which is very cool for certain types of headlines. Uh, but, as you can see, the number of characters is hard-coded, so it's not very flexible. So, what if I went over all my, uh, all my elements with the typing class, and I set a length property on them with the actual length of their content? It's only three lines of JavaScript, but it makes this code much more flexible. So now, let's convert it to, let's remove the animation. And let's convert it to use variables. So I already have the length variable and I need to multiply it by 1ch. And here I just use it raw because I need the number. And this is exactly why it's good to, to set the, uh, the variables in raw numbers instead of units. See how I needed both of them, both, this, both with the ch unit and the raw number. And that should actually work. Let's reapply the animation, see what we did here. Okay, it works, but it worked before as well. So let's try changing the text. CSS variables, oh. And let's reapply the animation. Yes, it worked. Um, and also, Let's say I remove it, I make the text even shorter and reapply the animation. So now every character takes ages because the duration is the same regardless of the length. But why not convert the duration to use length as well? Let's copy paste this and change this to be, say, one fifth of a second. This is basically how long each keystroke will take. You could even abstract it into its own variable. And as you can see now, oops, now every keystroke has the same uh, speed, regardless of whether this is saying CSS or whether it's saying CSS variables are awesome. So 
so there you have it. And another very common use case these days is applying different effects as you're scrolling through a container, um, like styling it differently, and this is usually done through JavaScript as well. And of course, we're going to use a little bit of JavaScript here too. So we're, uh, but we don't have to hard code into the JavaScript what kind of CSS we're applying. We can change the effect at any time. We, we will have the data in our CSS. Uh, so we use a class of scrolling. We go over all elements with that class. And when they're scrolled, we add an event listener on their scroll event. And then we calculate what is the percentage of their scroll. So we've calculated here what is the maximum scroll. It's scroll height just gives you the entire height of the content uh, and offset height gives you the current height of the element. So if you subtract one from the other, you get the maximum uh, number that the scroll could be. And then a multi I'm getting the percentage of scrolling by dividing how, it, how much it's actually scrolled by how much it can scroll maximum. And I'm setting that into a property called scroll. So let's see what we can do here. Now we have a static gradient and what we want to do is we want to change this gradient from 0 to 100%, depending on the scroll. So we can do, here's our friend calc again, scroll multiplied by 1%. And as you can see, it just works. And I can change the effect at any point. I can say, I actually want it to be a progress bar at the top that is 1m high and it's red. Oh, right, size. And it's, it works. I don't have to change the JavaScript. I don't have to get the developer and tell them, hey, actually, I changed my mind. And the developer is like, you always change your mind and you tweak the design so many times, I'm so fed up with you. <laughs> No, you can just tweak the design in the comfort of your own office without having to bug anybody because you have your data right in your CSS and you only had to bug the developer to write the few lines of JavaScript you needed to get your CSS variables. So I think, CS, I think this is the most important use of CSS variables. And this is exactly the kind of thing that you cannot do with SAS at all. Like SAS and JavaScript just don't mix. CSS variables are a revolution when it comes to separation of style and behavior. You have all these React people that are like, oh, let's move this, this CSS into our JavaScript because JavaScript must contain everything. We must move CSS into JavaScript and HTML into JavaScript and just the entire page should be a JavaScript file. <laughs> and then CSS variables come along and you can tell uh, these people to just set CSS variables and then you can do whatever the hell you want in your CSS with this data. And they don't have to even know about it. <laughs> These are the specs. Um, the first one is the, w, the, the, the more finalized one. And the second one is the more current one. So the specs, uh, in general, how W3C URLs work, um, the, the ones that have TR on them, uh, on the, on the, in the URL, are the, the, the revised versions that the working group has actually reviewed. Um, but the editor's drafts are the ones that basically, are, where every change first makes it into the editor's draft and then it makes it into the published specs. So the editor's draft are always more, uh, more current. So if you want, if you're interested in a spec that is still relatively new, you should look at the editor's drafts. But it could have mistakes. So before I, fin I leave you, um, CSS variables are not the future. CSS variables are the present. As we've seen, every, every browser supports them or is actively working to support them. <coughs> Edge. <coughs> but there are so many more things planned uh, for the future. And I'm, today I'm, on, I'm only going to, I'm only going to talk about one of them, but other things that are planned are custom at rules, again with dash dash. The dash dash we can't get rid of. Uh, custom at rules, custom functions. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about at apply because it's closer to the present. It already has an implementation in Chrome. 
Uh, I haven't written a polyfill or anything. I'm just using the native Chrome implementation here. So basically, uh, at apply lets you do mix-ins. So I can have a background of green and say a border of 10 pixels solid black. Um, all right. That's applied to the entire slide. Um, what else could I apply there? Anyway, you get the idea. It's applied to the entire slide, but you can understand what I'm doing here. Uh, so I'm using the uh, I'm using the at apply rule with the name of the custom property, which I've set here, and it imports both of these properties. And I can write as many properties as I want there, and it will import them wherever I want. Uh, you might be wondering, so what happens if inside this mix-in I use variables? Let's say instead of saying red here, I want to say var color. As you can see now, because color doesn't have a value, uh, this entire thing was invalid and it fell back to red, which was my fallback. If I change my fallback to gold, it will be gold. But let's give color a value. Um, it would be awesome if I could say color, I don't know, magenta here, and it just worked because then we, you could have real mixins with parameters. It's kind of an awkward syntax, but they're dynamic mixins with parameters. Sadly, this doesn't seem to work. What does work is if I specify, whoops, dash color here, and now it works because variables are resolved where you actually define the mixin instead of where you call it, which I think is very unfortunate. I don't know if it's a bug or if it's intentional. Uh, I hope it gets changed, because I think it would open many cool possibilities if it actually took the variable values from where you call the mixin. You could basically have functions in your CSS. How cool is that? Anyway, so that's what I had for you today. Thank you very much. Obrigada.